Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we get to sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players and related music industry experts. If you love playing guitar, stick around. You're in the right place. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitar, and I have uh, just not only a great guitar player, but just one of the nicest guys I've had the pleasure to talk to. We're with Dave Amato from REO Speedwagon, and I'm not the only guy who likes Dave. I mean, he's so popular. I, I've had like five or six other guys tell me that, you know, oh, you're going to love Dave. He's a great guy. And we've had a an opportunity to spend a lot of time talking uh, over the last few weeks before the call. He's just a, honestly one of the nicest guys I've spoken to. Dave's one thing Thanks. I, <laughs> one thing Thanks, I, thanks <laughs> I appreciate well, that. Thank you. You're welcome. One thing that you know, he's so nice. I'll excuse him for this that he's from Boston and he's a he's a Red Sox fan. And I grew up near Yankee that's, Stadium. That's right. Wow. <laughs> uh, First place too. I might might add right now. Big time. Hush hush. Uh, he started playing guitar in 1961, but once the Beatles appeared on El- Ed Sullivan in 1964, that became something that took over his life. In 1980, he moved out to L.A., did a short stint with Black Oak, Arkansas, Sessions, played sessions for LaToya Jackson, and he sang backing vocals for David Lee Roth, Rick Springfield, and more famously with Motley Crue on the hit song Girls, Girls, Girls. And he's got a – is that a platinum record? Uh, yeah. He's yeah. got a platinum right. record right behind yeah. him overlooking his shoulder for that Girls, Girls, <laughs> Girls. He's got a great voice, actually. Um, go check him out online. He's doing um, uh, Derek St. Holmes' part with uh, a Stranglehold. And, um, on, anyway, he's got a good voice. Uh, and he's also, (laughs) he's also backed up Kim Carnes in 1985. He took a big role with Ted Nugent and Ted, Dave told me that his most memorable tour was in 86 when he sang lead vocals and played guitar with Ted and they shared the tour bill with Aerosmith. Right. And, And I actually, I am almost positive. I must have seen you because I saw Ted open for Aerosmith. So I uh-huh. had to be like and it was during that time. Uh, he stayed with Ted for three years, making uh-huh. little, little little Miss Dangerous in '86. And if you can't lick him, lick him. Due to a conf- <laughs> that's a great title. Due to a conflict of schedules, Dave had to leave Ted in December of '88, and they're still good friends, and they've even sta- shared the stage a number of times since then. Right. Man, I couldn't see any like you. I, you're just not someone that would ever piss anybody off. I don't imagine that there's too many guys you played with that like. Oh, Dave Amato is an asshole. I mean, you're just like very easy to get along with. No, I, I, I mean, I, I, I love music and all, all the people. I'm just so lucky with the people I've played with. They're just, just incredible, you know, people. I mean, I learned so much from Ted Nugent. I mean, Ted Nugent, you know, should be a Hall of Famer for sure. You know, regardless what you think of about yeah. him, that with his politics stuff. Sure. I mean, I mean, he, you know, he led uh, led the whole industry in the late seventies. You know, he played stadiums and. He's, he's an incredible, um, you know, really human being. You know, he's a good father, and I know him because you know I, I, I kind of you know, spend a lot of time with him. You know, you really got to know the the guy, you know, in, inside and out. And 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 among, he's a great guitar player too. He really is. Yeah, so really I is. mean, he taught me an awful lot, man. That was that was really good that he took me under his wing in the 80s that, that was a big learning curve for me and it, and I, I just watched him and he's, it was amazing you know and and it was still riding high then you know ted nugent mm. was and and uh it was an amazing experience for me at that time well, that's awesome and i'm going to ask you later specifically what you learn what you learn because i'm interested in that oh, <laughs> okay in 89 gary richrath left ario speedwagon there was an opening dave joined ario shortly after that and he's been on all the newer speedwagon recordings since then in 91, Dave also worked with Bon Jovi's Richie Sambora on his solo project, and he also toured with Cher. Man, thank you so much for your time. I'm so glad that uh, we got to connect. Oh, okay. This is awesome. It's my pleasure, man. We, you know, like, like you said, we talked uh, last week, and we becoming good friends. This yeah. is really, really a <laughs> pleasure, man. Yeah. Really pleasure. We know each other's dysfunctions already. <laughs> oh, boy. I, I, yeah, we can't put that on air, but okay. <laughs> um. It's amazing how many players, Dave, literally became committed to guitar after seeing the Beatles. And for you, what was it about that that event that motivated? Like, what was the trigger for you? Oh, man. Um, just great, great songs and great musicianship. And, you know, I mean, they had long hair and uh, the Beatle boots and, and the guitars. The guitars, you know, the John Lennon with that three-quarter... 325 Rickenbacker just knocked me out, you know, 
and of course Paul's Hoffner, little Hoffner bass, mm-hmm. you know, and and uh, and George with a Rickenbacker twelve string. I mean, that was the first uh, you know I've ever seen of that, or the Gretsch Country Gentleman as well. You know, I just wanted to, you know, you know, I just wanted to be the Beatles and and to form a, a gang. You know, they were a gang of four. And you just want to go like, God, I want to do that in my life. You know, I want to get a bunch of guys, a gang together, I used to call it. Yeah. Let's get a gang of guys together. Let's form a band and let's grow our hair and let's uh, let's try to do this like the Beatles. You know, it was, it was incredible to see that on the Ed Sullivan show. Changed my life. Yeah. I, I'm, I, I'm sure uh, and the, some of the guys in REO too, and I'm sure you talk to a million guys that say the Beatles changed my life. That's what I want to do. That's it. It's over. Probably eighty to ninety percent of the guys in yep. your age bracket, literally eighty to ninety percent, that was the trigger for all of them. Absolutely, it's just mm-hmm. and still and still to this day, I still listen to you know Beatle records. It's amazing. Even the off cuts are, are just incredible. You know, so and nobody writes like that anymore. It's 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 hard to write songs like that. It's just a two or three minute you know ditty little song, but you know. It's hard to write good songs like that. And I, I don't hear anybody doing that right now, you know, and, and it disappoints me because it's it's hard to do. And they did it like in their sleep. You know, they did like two records a year, two albums. It's nuts. Yeah, yeah, that is nuts. The, the, the amount of production they, they threw out there. Hey, question for you. You just made me think of something. Um, this is not really similar, but like I write ad copy and it's oftentimes much harder to write ad copy when you have a little bit of space versus a lot of space. And when you said that, I was curious, is it the same thing with songs? Is it more difficult to write a great two and a half, three and a half minute song than it is to write a great five or six or eight minute song? I, I think so, because you want to put, you know, everything you can into that three minutes. Um, you know, the Beatles did it, you know, uh, maybe, maybe chorus verse, you know, second verse, another chorus, whatever, and then maybe a little solo in there and then cram it into a two minute and 30, you know, two and a half minute yeah. song versus, uh, you know, a six minute. Maybe you can, you know, uh, stretch it out by doing a, a long solo in the middle or, or, or um, you know, whatever. Maybe you don't have to write as many verses. Maybe it might be more instrumental. You know, you could you can maybe be more relaxed with it, you know. So I, I think it's tougher to write a a short little song and make it make sense and right and tell a story. Yeah, I think it it's, is It's hard, man. It's hard. Yeah. I never thought of it until you said it. And I think it is because you got to get, you, you got to, you have to have the same opening, you know, beginning, middle, end of the story and closing. In, in two and a half minutes. Yeah. You know, I mean, I want to, I want to show praise to, you know, uh, Kevin Cronin in REO, you know, can't fight this feeling. You know, there's there's a story there, mm. there's a middle, there's a you know, and there's an ending, and it, and it's there's your song, and and it you know it it's a meaning. It may be different meaning to to other people, but there's a there's a there's a meaning in there. You know, or, uh, time for uh, a lot of REO songs. Time for me to fly. You know, um, in in a, it, those are short songs. Yeah, you know, they're yeah. not long songs, and it it I think it's. Really tough to write a real good song like the Beatles did, or you know Kevin and among other a lot of players. I, I you know I I can't think of right the second, but yeah, know, sure though. You know, lot of good songs are good songs, and if you can cram them into two and a half, three minutes, it's like amazing. Yeah, I think. In, in today's generation, man, that may be too. You need a fifteen-second song and it capture people's attention. You know, you know, nowadays, you know, you turn on the drum machine and it's the same beat. You know, same beat through the whole thing, and you make up a couple of words, and there's no chorus. There's no what's the what's the hook here? You yeah. know, what are you what are you saying? And there's 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 some I'm not not to say it's all bad, but. Sometimes I, I'd rather listen to a story and yeah. you know and, and get it all in in three minutes or whatever. Wow, you know, because I think that's hard to do, and I really respect that better than turning on the drum machine and having a couple of words, and then at the end of it, I go, "What? What is he? What is he saying? Yeah. <laughs> what is she saying? What? Yeah. You know, I'm, no, I'm, it's I'm just with me. you. I agree with you. I'm with you on that. Yeah. So in 1980, you moved out to LA. I was curious what prompted the move, and once you got out there, how did you start getting gigs and session work? Um. Well, I had a, a manager um, that managed Black Oak, Arkansas, um, Butch Stone. We, we had a, a, a band out there in, in Boston. I was uh, 
always in a couple of bands and uh a couple of my bands opened for Aerosmith. I was friends with the Aerosmith guys. We played high school gymnasiums with uh, so far back, like, like I guess 1973. You the first, first um, uh, Aerosmith record, um, and uh, we had a spec deal at Atlantic in, in New York. We we're going to in New York you know, like once a month and mm. cutting some tracks here and there, and and it just wasn't you know kind of like the couple of the guys in the band were just fighting, didn't kind of disagree on this, of course, like a band would do. And then uh, I, I just went to the manager and said, look, I, I don't want to fight anymore. I just want to try to make it. And and if there's anything out in L.A., because he had some of the Black Oak guys out in L.A. Hmm. And uh, I'm willing to move. You know, I'm willing to go where these guys that I was with weren't that, you know, didn't want to kind of want to be a, a big fish in a small town, I'd say, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, um there was opportunity to um, go uh, to L.A. and what was left of Black Oak. They were trying to still salvage that thing, and I, and they were looking for a guitar player. And I played a little bit of keyboards on the side, but I was a hack, you know, really kind of having fun with it. But I did a little bit on the side, and I was a singer, background singer too, high, you know. So uh, they got me out to L.A., and I kind of – we all had a band house, and I slept you know under a table in a sleeping bag, you know, <laughs> in 1980. But I, I was happy to be here, you sure. know. And warm weather, and I was in L.A., you know, in the 80s, which uh, started the 80s, which was just an incredible time in Los Angeles in the 80s, you know. And um, I did that for a while, but it didn't really work out. And um, I just kept going on on, uh, on auditions. I'd see an audition in the paper or something, you know, and I'd go on and I'd meet more people. And then I knew how to do kind of top 40, so I did it in, in Boston. So... I joined the top 40 band because they had to make money. Of course, you had to sure. eat and pay your rent, whatever. So, and, and it was down in Orange County, but I always lived in Hollywood. I wanted to be in the thick of things, you mm -hmm. know? So, um, I and I thought, if I do top 40 in L.A., I'm probably going to see be seen more than Boston. So, I went down there and I, I got seen by um, a Jonathan King and Journey, which was, he was, you know, it was huge. Sure. Um, actually, his brother was in another top 40 band down there. And I think I played with Muggs after that too. Muggs Kane, which is Jonathan Kane's brother, he played drums uh, for. Um, uh, who are you gonna play with? I uh, uh, can't think off offhand. Um, anyway, um, so he, he said, um, you know, uh, Jonathan's wife. They were on RCA, and Jonathan did produce a record, and um, and he, they're looking for a guitar player singer. So uh, I did an audition, and the next thing I knew, we were. I was in the Tawny Kane band, which is Jonathan Kane's uh, wife, on RCN. It was it was great, and and Tim Pierce was the other guitar player. That's <laughs> wild, know. fantastic, Timmy. And I learned a lot from Timmy at that time. You know, I just came to L.A. and Tim Pierce was you know he played on Rick Springfield. He was doing like Michael Jackson records. He was doing you know a lot of sessions. Mm. So um, I just you know kept meeting people and and climbing up the ladder. It was it was an exciting time, man. The eighties in Los Angeles was an amazing time. So you basically were out there pounding it and pounding it, and then it start one thing connected to another. Yeah, I I, I wanted. Um, let's see, I, I we we were on tour with. Um, uh, let's see, uh, uh, Eddie Money with with Tony Kane Band. We played, yeah. you know, uh, Eddie Money, and um, I'm not thinking so fast here. Um, um, Mr. Mister's guitar player, Mr. Mister. Mister? Um, yeah. Uh, who gosh. Who is Eddie's guitar player? I interviewed. That's Tommy Gervin. Okay, I interviewed a, a couple of guys that played with Eddie. It was later yeah, in his their career, though. I think. Well, you, you're sending me back, so I'm, I'm not thinking about. Uh, God, I can't. He think was of he was really big at, back in the day, Eddie Money. Uh, Eddie yeah. Money. Yeah. Huge. Yeah, he was really we opened great. for any money. Yeah, he was he was huge. He had you know took two tickets to Paradise. He has a bunch of yeah, hits. Yeah. Um, he was a New York City cop. Cop. <laughs> That's right. How funny is That's that? That's right. I love any money. I, I love him. We, we played a lot of gigs with him in the nineties. You know, um, Steve Harris. Yes, Stevie. You know, I had just come to L.A. and and I'm playing with the Tony King Band, and Steve Ferris took me under his wing. From Mr. Um, well, not Mr. Mr. From Eddie Money because he's playing rhythm guitar, fantastic guitar player, and he said to me, "Dave, I got all these sessions in L.A. I'm kind of hooked up, and I can't handle them all." This was early '80s. 
I can't handle them all. And I like your guitar playing. Would you want to take some, you know, some some gigs off my hands? It won't be great, you know. It'd be, you know, it'd be secondhand gigs. But I, I, you know, I make some. I said sure. And and Steve Ferris, just I, I could eat and and do sessions. You know, he he was a big influence for me. And and he turned me on. He, he gave me a um, a set of strings. He said, "Hey, call this Dean Markley." guy because i'll give you i'll set you up an endorsement you know and i was just i was just new in la so you tell dean markley strings and i've had dean markley ever since so steve ferris basically really saved me man he got me all these gigs and i kudos to him with you know dean markley strings since 83 i think i started with dean markley and um i just kept going from there i all all the sessions he gave me were like second rate sessions but that led to that, that led to that, that led to, you know, it kept sure. leading to better gigs, you know, and better sessions. Well, plus you and, got to eat. Uh, yes, I got to yeah, yeah, Second rate sessions still pay. And, yeah. and, and play guitar, do yeah, it. You know, yeah. I didn't have to drive a truck or whatever. Sure, sure. So but, Steve Ferris was, uh, and he went on to Mr. Mr., of course, you know. Mm, and awesome. uh, he did great, great things himself. I mean, he was a great guitar player. That's so, awesome. so he took. He, it, he was like a mentor of yours at the time. Yes, Steve Ferris was amazing. He was kind of under um, uh, Lukather. Okay. You know, he was like Lukather was uh, on top. Of, okay. Steve was kind of uh, you know uh, under him, like a on the second string or whatever. But he was still up there. You know, yeah, interesting. a lot of sessions. Um, so he gave me, you know, he threw me his crumbs, which was I, I gladly accepted it. it yeah, awesome. hell yeah, yeah. It was, it was, uh, you know, so I owe, I owe him Steve Ferris big time. Cool. You know, Very and good. I always, I always, I always mention him in, cause he was, he got the ball rolling for me in LA. It's I awesome. think it's important. It's nice to hear that, you know, like it, I think everybody needs some help sometimes, you know, and it's good that this uh, guy stepped up and yeah. did it. Yeah. And I'm Steve sure there was, a, you did the same thing at some point for somebody else behind you, you know? Sure. Yeah. 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 And, uh, um, that leads me to, you know, I mean, down the road a little bit, but I was playing with Cher in 1989, and Richie Sambor was going out with Cher at the time, and he'd be on my side of the stage watching me, you know. Oh. So he he said to me, almost the same, you know, it kept, the ball kept rolling, you know, for me. And he said, he said hey, you know, Amato, I, like, I really like the way you play, you know. I'm just finishing up my solo record, and I'm putting together a solo band, and I think I want you to play guitar in my solo band. I'm like, you know, okay, Richie, you know, I mean, he's huge in Bon Jovi. Yeah, you know, yeah. He was humongous. And he was, you know, he was doing a solo record. And so he said, I said, he said, give me your number. I'm like, okay. So I gave him my number. And like a month later, he calls me. He goes, all right, let's go. We're going to New Jersey. Get your gear. And, that, and you're <laughs> off and running. So you're in a touring band. Yeah. The first solo tour with Richie Sambora, which was amazing. How did Amazing. you get hooked up with Cher? Oh boy, that's another story. It was, it was everybody in LA. What was this? Like 1989. Everybody in LA wanted an audition for Cher. There was 162 guitar players audition. Everybody, and it took You're months and me. months of call. No, months and months of callbacks. Months and months. And I just. I you know, I do the audition. I go in. They say, you know, thank you. They took a picture of you, which put down your resume, and then you wouldn't hear from him for three weeks a month. Of like, well, I'm out. And then all of a sudden, the management or whoever would call and say, um, okay, she wants to see you again. You're gonna come in, you know. And it, it got whittled down to groups of like it was three groups of like the first first band, you know, first rate band, and then the second string band, and then the third band. And they took took guys out of those three three you know bands they put together like little entourages yeah, yeah. Band. so i was lucky enough to be in this second string band and the drummer ron wixo and i who played with david lee roth after that and foreigner a great drummer uh he she plucked us out of there and uh it was 89 and i i did it on and off for four years because um I, i'd have to go and i had reo speedwagon then too so i had both gigs so the like, 80s were incredible man you try to do everything you can you, can, you know yeah a lot of stuff happening in the 80s and uh so i'd go back to reo and we would do a record or a little tour and then then Cher would call or the manager would call and say oh they she hates the new guitar player and you got to come back when are you free <laughs> so it was pretty good for me to do it for like four years on and off what and it was what? fun it was did you get any takeaways from that? Because she was such a massive star. 
What, what do you mean? Takeaways. Like, remember how you said you learned a lot from Ted? Was there anything that you learned on that um, on that gig, like business wise, or just watching her interact with people? Or oh, I, I loved her. Um, it was just you know the the music was fun. We 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 kind of rocked out because she was going with with Richie at the time, and it was more rock than I think it is now. You know, we didn't. We didn't do like gypsy tramps and thieves or something yeah, like that. Yeah, okay. we, we were we were rocking out. I mean, she she wanted to rock, so it was really fun for me. You know, I played all the leads and uh, and I played with really good musicians then too. So uh, Hugh McDonald was the bass player who just got inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Mm. So Huey was you know from Bon Jovi. Richie got him the gig as bass player, and of course Ron was playing drums. So the the rhythm section was. Basically, the three of us, you know, great players that went on and did a lot of other th- stuff. So I was around great players. I just, it was so, so fun, you know, playing with great musicians. You know, just elevate your game. Yeah. You know, you got to be on your toes, you know. And Huey McDonald from Bon Jovi, he's like a machine. You make a mistake, he's like, looks at you. Like, so you got to be on your toes. <laughs> Which is great. <laughs> Fantastic. Which is great, yeah. It you, makes you, your game, you know, it makes your game better. Absolutely, you know? man. You're respecting the other guy, you know, like, this, uh, like, He's not going to make a mistake, you know. One oh, yeah. time, I think. One time, I think I bet him twenty bucks. I said, "Tonight, I'm not making one mistake." You know, I'm like, like you know, he was like a machine. I'm telling you, the guy's a machine. So, you know, I'm up there and I'm playing about eighty percent of the show is done, and I'm like rocking. You know, I played, I play some solos, and then all of a sudden, like, I'm like I just get off on one thing, like, damn, he's like twenty bucks, <laughs> <laughs> twenty bucks. You owe me, I'm like shit. You know, this guy's amazing. So. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, he's, man. A good, he's still a great friend of mine, Hugh McDonald's. Amazing. Talk about Motley Crue. How did you get hooked up with those guys? Um, Tom Worman was producing a, a, a Ted Nugent record in, I think it was 80, 86, 87. Um, and uh, the, the crew loved Ted. They, he, they, they all loved and respected Ted Nugent. Um, so we were doing pre-production and uh, we were in the same studio and Tom Warren was doing, you know, both bands and he was just finishing up the Girls, Girls, Girls record and they needed um, some backgrounds on uh, Girls, Girls, Girls and Wild Side. So, and they knew, you know, I was Ted's lead singer and they asked me if you want to sing backgrounds on Girls, Girls, Girls and I heard the song. I'm like, oh my God, this thing is going to be a smash, you know? <laughs> so you, I mean, you knew I, right there. I knew the song it was just, it's incredible. I mean, Tommy Lee was, you know, his drums were just insane, you know? And I, I watched him in the studio, and I love those guys. Those those guys were just great guys and great, I, I think, great musicians. And, and Nikki Six and I became friends at the time. And I did the girls' record, and I, I sang some more songs, about half the backgrounds on the Girls, Girls, Girls record. And then after that, uh, the you know, uh, they call me for um, Doctor Feelgood after that, but I, I was with REO, so I couldn't I couldn't do that one. But then Nikki called me in to do the demos on Decade of Decadence. Yeah, I did too. I did demos. He t- Tommy called me on. I mean, not Tommy. Uh, Nikki would call me to do demos on uh, on Motley Crue songs. I go in and do the demos. It's so so much one experience. That's weird. Why great. would they do demos on their own? St- they did demos, and some of the demos, uh, you know, stayed on the Made on it. the record. You know, yeah. 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 You know, some of the songs they might not have used. I don't remember exactly this long time ago what I sang on, but um, I think one was uh, "Primal Scream." They say I sang with the background says Tommy Lee and I singing "Primal Scream." You know, scream, shout. You know, That's so and he funny. Said, and I used to be in there, and uh, and Nikki would go. He'd be in the control room, and go, "Hey, Dave, this is the crew, dude. You gotta bleed." You know, <laughs> you can't just sing it. You gotta bleed, dude. This is the crew. You know, it's so funny. So, I mean, I'd leave the, I'd leave there with no voice left for weeks. You know, this is the crew, so, dude. You gotta bleed. You gotta bleed, you gotta, dude. This is the crew. He's a dude. That's you gotta bleed. Come on, Dave. Like, so I'd leave there. And go, hey, thanks a lot. <laughs> you know, at the end of the session, man, I would be bleeding for sure, but. I love those guys, and they made great records. And Nikki, Nikki, and Tom, all those guys, were great guys. And I, I ended up singing on um, on a Vince Neil record too. After that, or something, backgrounds on uh, I think one song I did afterwards. One thing very cool about the music industry is that it's it's um, if you do good work, people 
you get remembered. Yeah. Even yeah, years I, later, like, you know, it seems like. Or, or I, I got, you know, recommended, you know, that that's I kept going from one thing to the other. You know, I guess I did a good job. So they liked it and they said, you know, hey, Amato comes in and sings backgrounds or whatever, you know. And on the, um, I don't know what what record it was, but I went in there with, with the crew and I was just sitting on a chair and doing background vocals while they were rehearsing for, I can't remember what record it was, but, um, and uh, that was fun. <laughs> just hired me for that. No guitar, just sitting on a chair and watching them, you know, write songs, you know. And I, I really, I got paid for the day, but I really didn't do too much. Nikki would say, hey, chime in and some background vocals on this, you know. It was like, it was like so easy and fun to watch them watch the, the craziness you know it's pretty pretty wild oh, so the like that they're, they're all, all the stories or the reputation was like legit with those guys yeah, back in the they, day well i guess i mean i i don't know you know i mean i've heard the stories too but i i just love the guys they were good guys yeah. really nice nice human beings they were good guys and i i you know like the like nugent everybody think you know there's different sides that they think ted nugent or motley crew like but they were they were all good guys, just well, really nice to me, and I, you know, they were friends of mine. It, it was it was really pleasant. I loved them all. Well, you know, it's interesting what you say about Ted. I think that um, I saw someone wrote something on Facebook about two or three weeks ago, and they said, you know, years ago, you'd meet somebody, and you'd never think about like what party, political affiliation, or you know, what is this guy thoughts. You would just kind of meet somebody and and like them or not like them because of you know who they were yeah and their politics was like a you know it's kind of like you know who they're married to or who they're dating that's really not relevant to your relationship no and no it, it's it's one on one you know if you like the one on one you know it, of, of, like you say of motley yes the stories you know uh, whatever, Hollywood, you know, whatever they did, you know, drugs, hotel rooms or whatever. I, I, I didn't associate that. Yeah. I, I associated with that with Nikki six with, with, with friends, you know, with a, a guy, you know, yeah. and, and respected his writing and respected, you know, as, as a musician. And, and he, he was a good guy to me, call yeah. me for the, and they, I didn't ever see him messed up, you know, with me, you know, yeah, it was sure. business and went in the studio and they, they made records, man, you know, and, and Ted Nugent, I, I've I've slept on Ted Nugent's couch, you know. Mm. I mean, we were rehearsing in, in his in his uh, garage in the back in in Michigan, and he'd wake me up in the morning and say, uh, "Hey, hey," uh, he used to call me Amatsky. Hey, Amatsky, you want some eggs? You know. And it was just him and I. Yeah. And he'd go to the hen. He had hens in the back. He'd go to the hen house and pick up. Eggs, and he'd make me eggs in the morning, and we wash dishes together with Ted. Yeah. I'm like, I wish I had a camera on me because you know it was like. A guy with a guy. Yeah, you know, he's just doing normal guy stuff. Yeah, and, and yeah. Ted was a, a good family man. I've seen him with his family. He was a, a you know, a good down home country. You know, he, yeah. he lived in on a farm. You know, yeah. regardless of whether he was a hunter, I didn't care. Right. I wasn't a hunter myself. I didn't get involved in that. Yeah. You know, no, or I, or our politics with him. You know, I I was just a you know I respected him as a guitar player, mostly music. I yeah. wanted, you know, so. That's all. No, I agree yep. with you. And it's a, it's. I don't know why that this other like dimension has suddenly. I, it's just divisive, you know. There's there's nothing good that comes out, you know, because you could look. You could it if you want. You could find something negative in anybody. That's easy to do, man. Sure. You know, you don't sure. like the people they hang out with. You don't like the brand of booze they drink, whatever. But right. it's just like divisive, man. You know, and I don't. I, I struggle with that at times because I don't care about any of that shit. I, I mean, I don't either. I, I think myself, you know, just me speaking, I think Ted Nugent should be a Hall of Famer. Yeah. From all he's done, yeah. how many years he's done it, yeah. I mean, you know, regardless of, but I guess it gets a little bit, you know, clouded with the with the hunting and the, and the politics, you know, which is, as a musician... He should be a Hall of Famer. Yes, yeah, it's it's, a, it's mutually right. exclusive to his uh, to his performance as a musician. Yeah, yeah I, I respect him, as, uh, you know, as a, as a Hall of Famer. I, I'm just looking at you know yeah. his music, what he's done. Yeah. That's an, an incredible and, amount of work he's put out there, you know, and 
you know, he led the box office in the late 70s. Yeah. You know, stadiums. I mean, God. You yeah. know, I, I guess I was there, you know, at the in the 80s, which he was still riding pretty high, you know, and I, I saw it with my own eyes. It was incredible yeah. how he, he got a crowd going. It was in, insane. And, so, and, and what's amazing is if people think that there aren't other musicians who hunt and who are like politically conservative, you know, that's like saying, yeah. uh, you know, oh, there's no gay football players. Uh, bullshit. <laughs> you know, I mean, right. uh, nobody in the NFL is gay. You know, of course, I mean, it's just like, you know, people are people, man. You know, it's just no. Uh, right. I mean, I mean, if he's, a, if he's an incredible football player and, he, and he's gay, who cares? Right. Who gives a shit? You I know. know. I mean, I know. Who cares? He's uh, a great football player, so he should be honored for that, you know. And you know, know, you can't, man. you know, don't don't cross, you know. I know. Cross me, he's whatever. He just want, you know, he's his own person. Leave him alone, you know. Yeah. He, if he's a great, you know, if he's a great guitar player, honor him for that, yeah. you know. Don't, oh, because he shoots what, a bow and arrow or something, you know. Come on, yeah. you know, just whatever, you know. I, I never got involved in that either way for, with the crew or you know, for example, you know, the bad boys. Uh, I don't care, you yeah. know. They were good. They were good to me, and they were good people. Yeah. That's all I care. They were good people. I, the Motley Crew guys are good guys, and Nugent's a, a good guy. Over, if you knew him underneath, Nugent's a good guy. Really is. He's That's a sweetheart. Great. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Man. Thank you for sharing that, man. Oh, no problem. Talk about how'd you get connected with Ted in the first place, and then talk about you. You started telling me a story earlier about <laughs> turning Ted liked your amps or something like that. So, so how do you get how'd you get hooked up with Ted in the first place, and then talk about the the story that was kind of cool. Um, I was with uh, Ricky. Ricky Phillips, who was a, a great friend of mine to this day, plays you know, bass and sticks. Yeah. yeah. Amazing, amazing musician as well. You know, played with uh, the Babies and and uh, uh, who was after that when Neil uh, Neil Sean and uh, Jonathan Kane, um, the next band he was in. Anyway, uh, um, I know he was with uh, was was with Sammy um, Hagar, but that's not what you're talking about. No, um, with John Waite uh, after after the Babies. Anyway, you play you play in a Tony Kane band together. Talking about Johnson Kane, you know, mm -hmm. we played together. We've known him for you know thirty plus years, and he's a good friend of mine. And he knew uh, Doug Banker, which is Ted Nugent's manager. And he called me up one day and he said, um, "Nugent's looking for a singer, guitar player, and I think you're, I think you should, you know, you, you should fit the bill, you know." You, cause Ricky you're called and, you and told you this. Yeah, Ricky yeah, called okay. me. You know, so he gave me, I think Doug Banker, if I can remember correctly. Um, I think he gave me the number. So uh, Nugent was doing a record in Burbank, California, and I went down to the studio, and there was just me and another guy up for the job. So I I I, I went out the job job. That was Little Miss Dangerous record, and I sang half the half the record. When I got, he said, you know, okay, you're going to be my singer and guitar player. So I did half the record with him. It was just him and I, and and a producer, and a it was like a. A drummer slash, you know, he he was produced a record, co-produced a record too, sure. and uh, it was him and I on kind of two records. We just kind of hired guys on, even though with the uh, lick 'em, if you can lick 'em, lick 'em. It's crazy, a great, crazy great name. title. Yeah, you know, you've seen the, the the album cover. You know, it was a girl against the ropes. You know, she's laying against the ropes. It's like if you can't lick 'em, lick 'em. Hello, <laughs> <laughs> Ted Nugent style. Yes, for uh, sure, man. And. Uh, we uh, the the uh, let's see. We finished the record, and he said that was 1985. And he said we're going to do one show this year. I only have one show booked because we're going to finish this record this year. And then the next year we went out with Aerosmith '86. You know, that was a big one. Hmm. And I said, "What is it?" He said, "We're going to do the uh, the Cotton Bowl in Dallas, Texas. Ninety-one thousand people. Wow! And that was I said, okay." You know, so, <laughs> was that the and, biggest you know, arena you had played at the time I'm assuming. At, at the time oh yeah. yeah by far you know and um so i said well are we gonna do any warm-ups warm any warm-up gigs before that and he says no nah, i like to break my boys in right <laughs> that's what he said to me i'm like oh my god so we rehearsed five days in uh michigan and then we went to dallas because that the cotton bowl is in mm -hmm. dallas texas we went. We did five days rehearsal. We did ten days rehearsal, 
And then we, we did the gigs. My first gig with Ted Nugent, 91,000 people. It was like in August and it was 104 degrees. They were hosing down the people. It was, it was crazy. I mean, my legs were shaking. It was, it was crazy. That was my first show with Ted Nugent. And Tommy Aldridge. Um, the drummer. Who was in Black Oak, Arkansas and Whitesnake. And he drums. played for Ozzy. Yes, yes. Holy Tommy shit. Aldridge. He's a monster drummer, that guy. A monster. He was the drummer just for that gig at the time that was his drummer at the time amazing tommy aldridge and we became friends tommy and i i love tommy aldridge amazing drummer yeah excellent and really good drummer and a great and a wonderful guy wonderful so um and bon jovi went on before us before ted so bon jovi was the second album you know so they were just coming up and they, yeah. were, they were they were incredible they were incredible so did you and, so did you at that time when you were, did you get to talk with Richie at all? That I, Ted, Ted, you know, because Ted knew, I mean, I was the new guy on the block with mm. Ted. So Ted go, used to go, hey, hey Amatsky, come on, I'm going to take you over to see those Bon Jovi boys, you know. Because here, <laughs> I'm going to tell you that the, the deal was that Night Ranger was going on after Ted. Mm. And he said, uh, Come on, let's let's go see let's go see the Night Ranger boys. So he went over to see the Night Ranger boys, and he said he went in there. I, I if I believe if I remember correctly, I think he said, uh, "Let's go warn the the Night Ranger boys to follow Ted in Texas. We don't want to be following <laughs> Ted Nugent in Texas, you know." So I think if I remember, he goes, "Come on, Amoski, because you know you always used to take me over there." So I think we talked to the Night Ranger boys. Said he said to him, "I, I you know, guys, I'm going to give you a fair chance here." You want to go on before Ted in in Texas because you're gonna get you know you're gonna be in trouble you know, and I think um, I think they saw the cat with Jesus um, <laughs> walking on. Uh, so I think he said um, to them, you know, and they and they said, well, no, Ted, we have Sister Christian, and we got you know, you can tell me you love me, and we got a lot of hits, Ted. You know, we you know we we want to keep the where we going. He says, okay, I'm just gonna warn you. You don't want to go on after Ted and, and you know, see, and then he took me over to uh, Bon Jovi boys because he said, I, hey, Amoski, I like those Bon Jovi boys because they respect Ted. They want to go on before Ted. <laughs> see, you know? So he went over, we went over to, to, that's when I first met Richie and the guys, but I really didn't know, know them, you know, I mean, I've, I've heard, heard of them and, yeah. and they, they were great. And, and John Bon Jovi was really respectful of Ted and Ted loved that. He said, "He said I love those Bon Jovi boys because they go, they respect Ted. They you respect know? Ted, and he loved he loved the Night Ranger guys too. Don't get me wrong, you know. But he just said, you don't want to follow Ted in Texas. That's so and funny. I don't want to tell you what happened, but it was it was pretty, you know. Oh, when really? Night, when Night Ranger went on. They were yelling Ted, 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 Ted. They love Ted in Texas. Yeah, big because time. it's all conservative fan base there. Yeah, big time yeah. Ted and you know, so." I, I think I think uh, Night Ranger guys said you know came back after the show and said okay we'll never do that one again you know yeah wow so yeah, that was a pretty little lesson for you know don't follow Ted in Texas Texas yeah so so let me ask you this. so is it like so years later when you wind up touring with Richie does it ever and it may not be for you because this is like what you do but do you ever say shit here I am touring for with with Richie and I met him at that show X you know yeah. 15 years ago is that is that like like that odd not odd but is it like you know funny like you think to yourself god I never would have expected that no no I I told him about it I said Richie remember and and Richie's Richie's good you know he said yeah I remember that day you know I remember it. I said remember we came in with Ted you know we we said hi and that's the first day I'm sorry. And I did see him, I think, once or twice at a NAM show after that. Okay. You know, it was so, like, what, 80, let's see, 85 to 89, I guess. So in between that, I think I saw him at a NAM show or two. And I think I went up to him and introduced myself again because, I mean, I respect, I love Richie Sambo. He's one of my good friends, you know, and I love the guy dearly. Mm -hmm. And he talked about a great guy. He's, he's an amazing guy, you know, as are the um the Bon Jovi guys I think as well you know <clears throat> um so no I, I, I to answer your question no I never thought you know I just thought if I can be friends with Richie cuz I respect him so much that would be great you know and he's a, he's an incredible guy mm. incredibly nice guy you you'd love him you know if you you should interview him too 
Yeah, what a, talk about some stories. Wow. Oh my God. Yeah. He's you know? got a bunch wow. of them. Yeah. I think you should interview him. All right. Like, that let's, would be let's, let's make that happen. Fantastic. Yeah, I'm telling you. Um I'll try to put I'll try to put a few words in for you. Yeah, man, that'd be awesome. I'd love to have him yeah. on the show. Uh that guy Tommy Aldridge, though, he's a I I he's a monster. Incredible. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he he's pushing I mean, and the bands he played with driving those bands is not easy his feet when i was with nugent because nugent like double bass drum, you know his tommy tommy aldridge's feet is amazing yeah. amazing feet you know not to mention his upper you know his upper yeah. half, but i mean his feet was just it was just insane what a freight train yeah when he goes his double bass is going it's a freight train it was so much fun it was it's such an honor, you know, to play with Tommy. It was it was incredible, you know, to to cut my teeth on the first gig, ninety one thousand people with, you know, with Ted and and New and uh, Aldridge playing drums, insane, insane. So you said earlier. So so I want to I want to hear the Marshall story with Nugent, but also you said earlier when we first started talking about how you learned so much from Ted. Can you be specific about that? Just watching him perform. You know how he um, just grabbed an audience at the at the at the time. I guess he still does now, but at the time, he just commanded. You know, the audience did anything he told them to do. It was, I guess, you had to been there at the time. But I, I remember him going out on the uh, in the Philadelphia Spectrum. I just remember one time. He had his um, Gibson Birdland um, coming out of the rafters in the ceiling. It was, um, it was uh, the strap was hooked to a, a hook, and um, he he used to just come out, no announcement or whatever. The lights went out with with one spot, and he go to the center of the stage with like one of those Rod, Roger Daltrey, you know, with those uh, tassel jackets on, you know, yeah, whatever, yeah. You know, Roger Daltrey used to wear in the mm -hmm. like like uh, suede, you know. And he just, they go nuts. They just see him. You know, he's six foot something, you know. Yeah, he's a, and yeah. he he come out there and he just raises his hands up in the air. And, and the bird land would slowly come down from the rafters, you know. And the people would go and they'd see there's a spot on the, on the guitar coming down. It just commanded like the people would go berserko. And he, he'd unhook the, 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 the hitch on the strap, you know, put it around and hit an A chord and they would just lose it. <laughs> you know, with his, with everything on ten and blasting, you know, and they would just, and he had him. He didn't even play a note yet, and he had him. You know, what I mean, and I just look, watch that, and go, oh my god, that's that's incredible. You know, the 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 power he had over an audience at the time, you know, was mind blowing. It was mind blowing. A Ted Nugent at the time, you know. And when when he was younger, I mean, he still does it in a way now, but you know, he's older now. But sure. But at the time, and I can imagine in the seventies, I wasn't there. But you know, when he when he did stadium, he he did stadiums all the time with sixty thousand people, fifty mm. sixty thousand people, and he he tamed them anything they wanted. They they asked dad whatever you want me you know, to do, you know. So I just saw that and 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 watched them and. And learned, you know, just uh, his some of his moves, what he did, how he acted, you know, and just I, I just you know was uh, writing down in my head, you know, more stuff to do, you know, yeah, what was what was good from him because he was a showman and an excellent guitar player, so it, it was an experience. It was a great experience for me. Did he write? Did he do all the solos on those songs like um, like Str Stranglehold, for example? Yes. Oh yeah, that was yeah. him. Yeah, that yeah, was him. Yeah. Wow, I think that's Derek amazing. played rhythm. Derek St. Holmes played yeah, rhythm. Yeah, that's pretty yeah. freaking cool. Yeah. It's some real yeah. good guitar work on there. Oh, absolutely. Great, to you know, Stranglehold, you know, all that soloing is fantastic. G great tone, everything. I mean, Great tone, yeah, yeah. great tone. I think those were showmans or something. It was like 100, 100 watt showmans on 10. It was crazy. Oh, you want me to Yeah, the Marshall, the Marshall story. Yeah, talk about the oh, Marshall story. Yeah, we were first rehearsing for the... Uh, I think it was for the Aeros I think it was for the Aerosmith tour. Yeah, it could yeah, it could have been for the Aerosmith tour. Um I had just gotten my Marshall endorsement and I had these uh 
JCM 800, eight, uh, Marshall 100 watt channel switching amps. And they were just new at the time. And, and I, I really liked them. And, and he came over to me and he liked, you know, liked what I was doing, liked the sound that I was, I was doing. He said, uh, you know, hey, Amatsky, what, what, you know, what amps do you do? This? There's 100 watt Marshalls. And I just got the, the endorsement. He goes, oh. Well, those are really nice. Can you get me you know, a couple? I'm like, well, sure. You're, you're Ted Nugent, of course. You know? <laughs> and, and he had a bunch of Marshall cabinets left left over. He had, I think he had Marshall heads, but he wanted he really liked mine. So I got him two heads, and he shipped them in, and and we had them like side by side, and we we're just rehearsing before the tour. And I told him, <laughs> you know, like teaching Ted Nugent how to set his amplifiers. Yeah, right. And and I said, well, this is how I set mine. You know, I got this on that, and the treble on six, and. And, and this and that, and the master volumes. And he goes, oh, that sounds really good. And he said, he took his amps and he ducked, he, he decked every control on 10. <laughs> right, across, right across the board. And he said, two Marshall 100 watt heads, you know, in, in stereo, he had a chorus, he would hip up both of them. And he said, that's the way Nugent does it. He just he dimed like, every everything. like bass, treble, everything. The whole every knob on the amp was I was on ten, and then he had this big birdland, big birdland, hollow bird, birdland went. Yeah, but how did he control that with that he hollow? Just put the volume. He knew how to handle that birdland. Everything was on ten. He decked it. He decked it. He just knew how to handle the the birdland. You know, he just was, uh, and it fed back. That was a yeah. And he used to he used to pull the six like the six string like way up high. He goes, "Hey Amato, that's my moose call. All the mooses <laughs> come running when I pull." <laughs> he sounded <laughs> like he was a lot of fun to to. to he, he, no shortage of uh, uh of of humor on the on those. Uh, no, he was uh, touring with Ted Nugent was was incredible. It was an incredible experience, you know. Mm. So I mean, I gave I just put my hands up in the air. He decked everything on ten. I'm that's like, hilarious. Okay, man. forget that's the way the that's the Nugent way. He said to me, "I'm like, oh, okay, never mind." Well, what's really funny is you're like probably really patiently explaining. I oh, did. you know, yeah, and like you know, like oh, this is you know, and I put this on seven, and I could see you being like real thorough. Well, because if you turn this up hot, you know, I could see you just being like very because you're very right. precise with all your stuff there. I know you're very deliberate and serious about it. And he's like, yeah. okay, great. <laughs> and, and you know he was really patient on uh, you know listening to me you know i do it through the whole spiel without him saying a word and then he took the amp and said well this is the way i do it <laughs> you know how funny I is said, that man okay i got it, I got it. <laughs> wow okay, and he handled it he, i'm like wow but it was i tell you what it was loud on stage he had yeah. four cabinets spread you know two marshall heads with four cabinets and there was spread. There was two in the middle behind them, with one a dummy, like a dummy in the middle. So mm. he split that, and they had one far right and one far left for twelve cabinet, and wow. it was blistering loud. And you had two one hundred watt heads. Two one hundred watt heads with four cabinets. Oh, yep. Shit. Yep. And what were you playing <laughs> through? You you playing through the I same had, thing? One one hundred. I had two hundred watt heads, but oh, yeah, two, two cabinets. Okay. On my head, my side. That's a two lot cabinets. of volume out there, man. Oh my god, I definitely lost a lot of. <laughs> on, on the years with Ted, I definitely lost a lot of hearing for sure. Wow. No question, no question about it. And then how'd you wind up getting hooked up with REO? Uh, let's see. Um. One of my friends, Jesse Harms, who was uh, playing keyboards with um, Sammy Hagar, he was a, a staff writer on, on Geffen. Mm -hmm. He had a staff staff writing. You know, he was also playing you know, with with Sam, and he wrote he wrote songs with Sammy too. So he was in Sammy's band. But in the meantime, he was you know he wrote songs for actually he wrote a song um, "Walk on Water" for Eddie Money, which was a hit. Uh, that was Jesse's song, Walk, Walk on Water. It was a good, great song. Um, so I used to be his, guinea, his, his demo man. He'd say, hey, Dan Amato, I got another song. Come over to my house. He has a studio in the backyard. And I'd, I'd come over and play, you know, on his demos. Yeah. Or, you know, he, he, he always had songs every week. You know, and, and, you know, he used to pay me, and that was another section I did. You know? Sure, yeah. And I loved Jesse. He was, he was a great writer, fantastic writer. And... Um, so he started, he hooked up with Kevin Cronin with REO, you know, after Gary Richrath left, who was a writer, wrote a lot of great songs mm -hmm. in REO. Uh, he teamed up with Jesse. Uh, I, I think, I think Jesse knew his wife or his to-be wife at the time. I think she worked at Geffen. Kevin's to-be so, wife. 
Yeah, to be okay. yes. Okay. And I think that's the story. And so she hooked him up with Kevin, and they started writing songs. And um, they needed a guitar player because Ke- Jesse's a keyboard player. So they said, "Well, you know, uh, Amato does all. Um, you know, does most of my guitar playing. You, you know, he's a, he, he can do anything. You know, so so Jesse called me up and said, "Hey, you know, th- th- they need a guitar player for REO, and uh, why don't you learn two of their old songs? And then I, you know, here's the demos that Kevin and I are working on." play some parts on it because he used to like give me freedom to you know do what i want on his songs you know and he sure. guided a little bit but like oh i love what you're doing just do what you're doing so i guess i i he liked what i did on the demos with him and kevin's song so i went down there on a friday and um we played a little music i played larry's songs and like one o'clock and then kevin had a basketball court in the backyard we played a little basketball and then by five o'clock he says you want to join the band holy four hours shit. later we'll join our speedway i go like Sure. Okay. Okay. But the the funny thing about it was that after I told you backtracking here, after months of of doing auditions with Cher, <laughs> I got the Cher gig on the Wednesday. I swear to God, this, this sounds like a story. The Wednesday, the Wednesday before the Friday, I had the audition with with Ario. So you got the so gig two I, days before. So you got two major gigs in like two days. In, in one week. Yeah, one week. So wow. I had this share gig. So I was relaxed. I'm like, well, I got the share gig. So I'll go down and, and you know. And Do you think that helped you? I think it was more more relaxed. I yeah. didn't. I'm like, I got a gig already. Whatever. Right, right, right. I was like, you know, calm. of like, hey, I did all these auditions with share. And I'm like. I wasn't cocky or anything, but I already had the gig. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, you weren't stressed for like shit. I got to get this gig because I can't right. I'm eat. Like, oh, yeah, oh my, yeah. Oh my god! Oh my god! I need this gig so bad, you know. Yeah. And so, um, so I got I got two gigs in a week. Now what do I do? You know. So I, I had to go back to Sheer and quit and quit. Oh, she was mad at me. Woo! Was she mad at me, man? So I had to audition people to replace me, and I had just oh gotten the god. gig. And I auditioned some of the people that I saw coming in that I auditioned. That you had audition. with. Wait a minute. <laughs> so you didn't do any of that. You didn't. You you just. I, I thought you w- did both for a little bit in the beginning. I, I did. I think I. If I. Uh, God, all this. This is a blur behind me here. Um, I think I did a month with Sheer because Ario had some time off. Gotcha. So I think I did a month with Sheer. I think. Oh, she made me. I think I, I of course, I, I want to try to do everything in the sure. 80s. You know? So I think I fit in like a month with Cher out there, you know, and I didn't. And then I said, I have to go back to Ario because we were doing a record. We were doing the first record we were, you know, doing with Ario, you know, in 1989. Yeah. So it was serious so, business pretty quickly with Ario. Yeah. I, I wanted to, you know, I mean, because they made me a band member right off the bat, you know, and, and yeah. that, she said, and Cher said, why, why do you want to go with Ario? I said, well, they made me a band member. That's what the ultimate. You want to be a piece sure. of something. You know? Oh, I want to be a, that's what the ultimate goal is. You know, I mean, I was always a side man, a side man with Nugent, side man with Cher. I was just getting salary, you know, whatever. Yeah. Uh, and and with REO, I had a piece of the band, yeah. which was exciting to me. You know, Hell I wanted yeah. to keep that. But I, I uh, you know, I, I quit and I auditioned people for Cher and I thought, hey, you picked a good guy. What I, if I, this is all a blur if I remember this correctly, you know. So I picked a, a, a guy, and then all of a sudden, a couple of months later down the road, the manager would call me and said, she hates this guitar player guy. You, what are you What are you doing? Are you free, you know? And I, I say, well, okay, I, I, I got this month off with these. We, okay, you come back for that, you know. So I did it off, on and off, on and off for four years. It was wow. crazy. You know, when I had time and they'd call me or, you know, and it could be, three or four months span and then all of a sudden the manager would call me and say she wants you back she doesn't like this guitar player again and i'm like oh, okay you know I'm sure i'll try to fit it in and then i would coordinate with ario's management you know mm-hmm. which after four years they didn't like it very much so they said you know you want to you want to be in share you want to be in ario's like i said no i was just thinking you know, so finally it, you know it, it kind of ended but man congratulations because you've been with ario 20 20- the eight years 28 years yeah man yeah, that amazing. is awesome amazing that's yeah. like longer than most marriages man good what, for you what it, 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 it is a marriage no I, yeah marriage. it is it is yeah. it is 100 percent. congratulations yeah, and that's, I, and that's I, I, hard yeah it's hard it's, it's a, hard to get along with one person for 28 years to get along with three or four in the music business is, is to be commended for all of you guys man yeah you know what? I, I gotta tell you it's better than ever 
you know, some some divorces, you know, they get divorced and it's, you know, it's it's bad. I mean, we've had our difference in the 90s. You know, we used to fight over what song to play live. I, I used to fight with Kevin, like, why are we playing that song? You know, it's an off track, you know. Well, mm. I want to I, I want to sing it because it means something to me. I'm like, yeah, but it's, you know, it's not the yeah. right song. Let's, you know, we used to go back and forth a, a lot on that, you know. But but now, it's, you know, we're older and... and I just go, sure, let's try it. I don't, yeah. I don't care, you know. And and I, I tell you what, I get along with the guys. Well, everybody gets along better than ever. It's really a, a great family, you know. We've kind of been through the war together, and I don't know. It's 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 been lately. It's been really great. I mean, for years now, not just you know a couple of months. Or whatever. Yeah, it's yeah. Been, it's been great, and 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 I, I really enjoy. It. I still enjoy it. Well, I think the key is what you said, man. When you, as you get older, you're like. Fuck it. Do I really care what song we play? I mean, you know, exactly. I mean, is it going to alter rock my fucking world if we right. do this song tonight? No. Right. It's just you let, I don't know, I, I, I you let so much shit go. And it's for selfish reasons because you're like, I don't need that stress. <laughs> right. Exactly. You know, right. And, and it's like not selfish, like at someone's expense, but like, you know, you're being, you're making smart decisions for yourself. Like, you know, right. what, is that what you really want to stress out of? No. You know, right. so I, that's good, man. I think it, it it worked out. You know, I learned myself because I I was kind of a hard ass at first. Like, why are we doing this song? I don't want to do that song. You know, it's just nothing. You know, I, I, now I go, okay, let's try it, and it usually works itself out. Even if I don't like it, yeah. You know, it always comes out in a wash. Hmm. Eventually, you know, if Kevin wants to do something, it is like, you know what. Maybe and I'd say something. I go. I don't know if this is going to work, but I'll try it. You know, right. I mean, instead of going like, I don't, I hate it. You know, yeah. And you, you know, you just learn to pick your battles. You know, yeah. and usually, uh, what I'm finding out finally after you know, you just go. It just works out. And Kevin, like, you know what? May, maybe you were right in that. Maybe we shouldn't do the song. You know, I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> instead of fighting about it, you know, yeah. it just, it, that's what I find lately. It's. I try it and go and just shut up about it. And then it, it you know, usually fits or it doesn't fit. Yeah. And that's a better way. I should have learned that, you know, 20 years ago or something. Man, we all should have. I should you know? have too. I could tell you're you that younger, much, more man. fiery. You're like, no, we, let's not do that song. Oh, it's going to kill us. You know, whatever. Well, you just learn like being right is not that important. No. That's... No. And, so, and sometimes you're wrong. You think you're right, but you're wrong. You yeah. Know? And, and yes. you know, in Kevin's case, you know, we played a song and it would go over and I'm like, well, I hate this song, but it's going over, you yeah. know, whatever, you know, myself. So, I, you know, okay, mm -hmm. yeah. whatever. No, I don't just like the song that I don't like playing it that much, but, but it's going over. So we, you know, better keep doing it. But usually it, it works itself out like yeah. now, you know, but yeah, it's, it's been a great ride well, with our cool, speed man. wagon. It's been fantastic. I'm sure, you know, and, and the same with other bands, I'm sure, you know, some guys don't, you know, oh, why are we doing that song? I don't like doing that song, whatever, you know. You no, know, that's a, it's a marriage, just like a, you know. You, oh, you know, absolutely, you know, man. You know, absolutely. Your wife doing something that you don't like, you just so you just shut up about it. And let's see if it works, you know, works it out or not. Yeah, well, that's what I was thinking of because I was like, yeah, it's the same. It is exact. It is a marriage, you know. It's a, it's a marriage. Yeah. It's a professional marriage, not a personal marriage, but it's, it's a marriage, exactly, man. You gotta yeah. live and die together. It's a, to some it's a it's a team. Yeah, it's a team. You know, it's, you gotta back each other up. It's. I guess we just realized that more and more. It's just. Uh, it's an it's a great group of guys. All all, all the Ario guys are just sweethearts. They really are, and they're friends. And they're we're brothers. We're definitely brothers after all this time. And it's, wow, it's, twenty eight years. What, that's what a great ride. Yeah. A, it's a great ride. I'm, I'm I'm still having amazing. So, hey, what are some of the bigger obstacles that you had to deal with? You know, overcome over this time, if there are any. You know, in all... in our in REO? No, or... no, no. In your in, in in your music career in general. Wow. Um, well, uh, you know the the in ear. I'm sure other bands. The in ear thing. You know, from you know going from monitors. I, I mean, I guess uh, you know now it's 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 the norm. You know, going from wedges and all that stuff, you know, and side fills and a lot of volume to, you know, kind of cutting it down. I'm sure this, uh, you know, I'm, uh, I'm preaching to the choir about everybody here, but the, you know, learning about the in ears, you know, and and that was a big catalyst from Kevin. He said, you know, I don't, I don't want a messy stage anymore with all these wedges, you know, on stage, and and 
at first I was kind of hesitant on that. And, but then when we cleared them out and we just used, you know, in the ears, it's, it's, it's much better. The clean stage, you know, you can hear good. And that was a big thing for me. You know, it took a while um, to get adjusted to, to not hearing. Yeah. Everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Like you know, that. it sounded like a little bee, you know, buzzsaw in your ear. And I'm like, this is, I'm hating this, you know, but then of course technology went out and you get better stuff and, you know, technology marches on and now, you know, I'm used to it and, and it's, um, and I have some ambient ones too, made um, with Sensophonics in Chicago, so I can dial in, you know, which which when they first started you couldn't do that. Um, you can dial in some of the outside world, so you can hear your amps or whatever, you know. Oh, that's great! So you can strike whatever balance you need to to take everything in and still walk around your environment and feel comfortable. Right, you can hear the in, you know, really as much cool. as you want in or as much as you want out, and um, I have this as. Uh, there's a switch on it that uh, Steven Tyler has the same ears as I do, and he has a switch on it, so I guess he can yell at Joe if he wants it. You can switch, and, and there's <laughs> microphones in it. <laughs> I don't know. There's, there's a switch on it. You can you know talk to people because there's microphones. Usually, you just have to take them out to talk to people because you can't hear. You know, mm. but there's a switch in the back. You could goes right out, so there's microphones on the outside of it. So it's great. You don't have to take them out of your ears. That's so Steven wild. Tyler uh, added that feature in there which is pretty cool that is pretty cool man because so, otherwise you have them in and you go like somebody's talking to you hey you know tonight don't play that and we go what hang on take, take my ears out well then you got to adjust to get them back in and it's time right. it's time it's time yeah. time consuming in between that and then you got to make right. the adjustment mentally with you know you're all sorted out after a song or two then to take them out and then pop them back in it's right yeah right. yeah that's pretty cool man um yeah I, but when i you know when i first i guess I think, you know, myself, I think I was the right guy to replace, you know, Rich Rath because, um, you know, I used Marshalls and he used JCM 800s. So the tone was, you know, pretty, pretty close, you know, pretty mm. close to me. Uh, at the time, I, with Nugent, I was using a lot of Fender Strats, you know, I was using, you know, oh, really? Nugent had the Gibson, so I went to Strats, you know, so there's a lot of, a lot of Strats and I played a lot of session with Strats because you could get more tones, I guess, you know, at the time, if I remember. And um, so Rich Rath had, you know, Les Pauls. So I, I kind of, I had a couple of Les Pauls, but now I got. It was <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. So, um, you know, it was a nice, it was a nice, now we collect them. Now I just love Les Pauls, you know, which yeah. I've had, I played, you know, all along, but I seemed to lead in, in the 80s towards Strats versus Les Pauls at the time. But mm. when I joined REO, it was it was uh, full throttle and Les Pauls. I think you have another guitar left in you. I don't know, man. I think there's another <laughs> another version that, to allow your collection to bloom, man. Like maybe oh, you think so? Yeah, like Gretsch or something, you know. Oh, boy. You got something else in you. You got at least one well, more guitar. Well, I've got, you know, I've got my, my signature <laughs> That's right. Gibson Les Paul now, you know. So uh, I'm, I'm deep in... You know, in the cement with Les Paul for sure. That's you know, very true. Very my true. own, uh, you know, Dave Amato Les Paul access. You know, let's let's talk about that for a minute. Um, and let me just tell everybody who plays guitar, Dave's got a beautiful. Uh, it's a custom Gibson Les Paul. It's a single humbucker. It's kind of like right. a you know, um, an old school junior kind of right. Yeah, based it, based on a junior. Yeah. Yeah. And it's beautiful. It weighs seven pounds. Uh, comes in HD TV yellow uh, right. with beautiful quilt. But he's got another color com coming out. It's literally the nicest sunburst I've ever seen. Single pickup, classic fifty-seven plus with a Floyd Rose. Talk about the guitar. How you designed it? It's it's just gorgeous, man. Well, Gibson asked me. That they were trying to beef up the um, Access series. And, you know, they were all two pickups. I think Alex Lifeson of Rush has one, but he has like a piezo acoustic pickup in it. You know, it's kind of like his own the design there. And uh, I was one of the first ones to play that. I I, I really like myself. I, I really like a, a Floyd Rose on a Les Paul. It's just uh, kind of fun to, you know, you get, get the Strat feel. I guess that came from the, from the 80s with me with a Strat. So I wanted a Floyd Rose on on a Les Paul. So I put it on one of my regular ones in the probably nineties. I, you know, attached the Floyd, but it didn't sit well because of the, uh, contour of the Les Paul, but they made the access is, is a little bit more, um, styled 
for the um, Floyd Rose on there. So I was one of the first ones to promote that because I really wanted Floyd Rose on it. And and then they came to me. I mean, I wanted my own model. And they said, well, you know, we've got a bunch of access with two pickups. So I, I, they said, can you come up with a different, you know, different idea? And I said, well, yeah, I, I, I'd like to have a one pickup one, you know, just uh, based on kind of a junior. So it, and, and the old... Um, TV finish, which I I have a couple of old fifties. Oh, you TV do the, the TV yellow. That is so TV yellow. Yeah, freaking. Oh God, I love those guitars. I, I love those guitars. That they're like my favorite. Yeah. So I kind of based it on on the you know the fifty like fifty five fifty six um, TV model, and but I said let's let's make it updated. Let's put some flames in it. Let's try to put flames. So. They named it HD, which means the flames are in it because the TV yellow didn't really have any flames. It was just kind of yellow, you know. Right. So they with HD TV yellow, and I I told them I'd, I'd like to put a one pickup because there's not any production model with a one pickup. I mean, guys, I think Billy Gibbons has one with a you know he just makes a one off. Joe Perry I think has one single pickup humbucker in a in a Les Paul or whatever, but. I said, let's. I want to make a production model with the, you know, Floyd Rose. So Gibson really went for it, and um, and then then um, uh, Philip Wharton, which is my cohort there in in uh, Gibson, uh, found a batch of um, white ebony in the back somewhere. I don't know, in the back of the the building. I don't know where he found it, but he said to me, let's. How about? And I love ebony necks, but I thought you just put a rosewood on it. But he said, let's make it special. You like ebony? I said, I love ebony. Custom, you know, custom guitars, you know, Les Paul Customs are beautiful, ebony mm-hmm. necks. So he said, I found a batch of white ebony. I said, oh, my God, what is that? You know, what's white? So he um, he said, look, let me put it on there. If you don't like it, we'll rip it off and we'll put some, you know, something else on there, you know, rosewood. And so he put it on there, and it kind of looked like a, a maple neck, almost like a maple neck strat. And I went, oh, my God. So he goes, no, no, let me dummy it down. You know, let me put some stain on it. And it looked really, you know, really cool. And and it, it is. So he sent me the prototype. And it is, it's white ebony. It's never been on a Gibson guitar before. Never put on there. And and still, nobody has it on there. So I'm the only guitar that has white ebony neck. And it's, an, it's a real ebony. And it's fast. And it feels like ebony. It looks a little whiter, but... It's still ebony on there, so you know it's an expensive neck, and and I they sent me the prototype, and they said any changes, and it was so perfect. I said no, let's just make them, let's go. So uh, and Gibson was happy with it. I'm I'm ecstatic about it, and I think it's a great guitar, and it's it's for basically you know it's it's a hot rodded guitar. Basically, it's it's for lead players because only have one pickup and a Floyd Rose, and um, it's got a '57 classic pickup in the bridge humbucker. And it's got a split coil tap on Cla- the um, classic plus, right? Classic plus, sorry, yeah, yes. Yeah. And it has a, a, a push pull on the tone pot because it doesn't have many trick, tricks on it. I had to put something else on it, you know, to have some fun with. So, and and Gibson Owens has a fifty-eight. It's based on a fifty-eight historic neck, so it's a little little fatter, but it's beefy. It sounds just just incredible. So, you know, Gibson, I'm honored to have a Gibson guitar. It's great. And, and it weighs seven pounds, roughly. Yeah, uh, roughly around is, seven pounds. And, and uh, like. what I like about with the Floyd is how they routed it out there, so now it sits just perfectly, and it's not right. invasive. It doesn't get involved, and, and it functions properly. You know, so versus you know, I put one on you know uh, an old Les Paul of mine, I mean, probably nineties or whatever it was eighties, and it, it sat up really high because of the contour of the old, you know, the regular standard mm-hmm. Les Pauls. You know, so the Gibson fixed that, and it, it lays pretty flat, but you can still, they carved out the body, so you can still pull up, you know, pull up or down, you know, uh, and it sways. I like it to sway a little bit up and down, you know, hmm. via maybe Eddie Van Halen or whatever, you know? Sure. But, yeah, so, it's a lot a lot of stuff you can do with it So for I would, one, pickup, one pickup guitar. Yeah, so anybody who's in the market for a new Gibson, check out the uh, Dave Amato Custom Signature Les Paul. It's re- I mean, I got to see, and he's got another color hopefully soon coming out. It's a Actually, one of the prettiest sunburst guitars I've ever seen. It's kind of like uh, cherry. It's it's a beautiful sunburst. It's cherry, but it's not cherry. It's just gorgeous, man. Literally the nicest sunburst I've ever oh, seen. Oh, thank you. So, That's pretty. Uh, yeah, oh, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I got the green light. I'm pretty pretty uh, close to getting it done. They, they're going to tell me this week, but I, I think it's going to happen. 
I awesome. definitely think awesome. so. So check out uh, check out Dave's guitar, the uh, Dave Amato uh, Gibson Les Paul. Beautiful freaking guitar. Hey, question for you. If you, you know, we talked about this a few minutes ago about being a little smarter now with bull- <laughs> bullshit decisions like argument over songs. But if you could go back and give advice to your younger self, you know, younger Dave Amato, what advice would you have given that you think you could have helped, you know, would, would have liked to hear or would have benefited from, maybe didn't want to hear it? Wow. Um, Ooh, that's a loaded one. Um, Hmm. Uh, you know, I, I did things, I don't know if I change a lot, you know, I did things great, pretty, pretty well, you know, I, I, you know, and the, um, the, uh, all the, the rungs of the ladder, you know, um, um, you know, I, I did anything I could. I didn't say n- no to anything. You know, I, I never said no. I just went for it. I think that's a good lesson for maybe a younger, you know, a younger guy coming up. You know, don't say no. Just go for it. Even if you think it's not going to be good, try it because you'll get something out of it. Um, I I guess I, I'm going to, you know, repeat myself again, which was kind of stubborn with, you know, with REO or something, you know, just opinionated or something you know i mean i mean maybe maybe a little bit be a little bit more open to stuff like i am now you know i guess i guess that comes with age right i mean yeah. for for everybody you know i think so um sure. uh yeah I, I guess that might be the biggest thing i was pretty kind of stubborn you know <laughs> Man, <laughs> my opinions it, it, you, I guess. You, that's that is i'm surprised to hear that but i guess we all change but that's really shocking yeah yeah uh, yeah I'm, I'm seeing uh Dave 2.0. Well, not not all things, but I, I guess I could have been. You know, I mean, I I liked I liked the ladder that I climbed. You know, I yeah. mean, I, I was open, but I, sometimes I get into a situation that I, I mean, not that anybody be mad, but I just thought, you know, I, I had opinions on stuff. Maybe mm. I shouldn't have been that opinionated. You know, I should have maybe been a little more open. But I guess that's that's youth versus a little bit older. You know, yeah. I guess uh, that's that's about. All I can, um, all I can think of, I I think I picked, um, you know, my choices for for uh, equipment or whatever. You know, I I definitely when I when I wanted something and I I, I stuck with it. I wasn't, you know, I I see a lot of guys. I'm not going to mention any names, but they jump. They just jump from mm-hmm. one company to the other. I'm not happy with this, and I'm not happy with that. I didn't. I didn't do that at yeah. all. You know, when I liked something, I stuck with it. When I wanted a Marshall endorsement, I wanted it bad in the 80s, and I stuck with it, and I'm still there, yeah. you know? And, you know, a, a Strat and a Fender, I didn't go really, you know, off-brand. I mean, I have a couple of a Nash guitars, which Bill Nash is a good friend of mine, which yeah. that's my only off-brand guitar really right now, you know? Hmm. And I love Bill Nash, and his guitars are, are fantastic. So. Sure. But, you know, amazingly for me is Gibson first and then I, Fenders, I like Tellys and I got some Gretches and Rickenbackers, of course. You know, but I'm, I'm like old school. I don't hmm. try a lot of, you know, the new stuff because I, 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 I like where it came from. If it you ain't know, broke, don't fix it. Yeah, yeah, it came from, you know, Jimi Hendrix and Eric Clapton in the 60s. Yeah. What did they play? Okay, they played Les Pauls or Strats or, or Tellys and they went through Marshalls. Marshalls it's like, yeah. hello, yeah, it's a yeah. no-brainer, you know? <laughs> so... Anyway, I don't got I don't got to have equipment, but that's you know, that's where I'm at. I like to be loyal. I want something, and I stick with it that I like. You know. Let's talk about gear for a minute. Now, I got to tell people that you have like just a majorly very cool collection of guitars. So this question's probably really difficult to answer, but <laughs> I know that your signature model is your go-to guitar. But right. after that one, what would be your top three? go-to guitars right now that you just like to pick up and feel good? Well, I, I have a 59 Les Paul um, custom shop, 59, that um, that they sent me out in the in the 90s. Um, it was beautiful wood. In the 90s, they were really had some beautiful striped, striped wood. And I would probably, that's, uh, other than my signature one, that's my second Go to one, you know, with REO and on the road. It's uh, probably a, a 59 Les Paul. And I have some 58s after that that are 
just absolutely gorgeous too. Um, I have one song I, you know, I, I, and I mentioned before back to the Strat thing. I like to keep that around cause I still love, you know, I love Strats too. And I have a one with a Floyd Rose with a, with a Seymour Duncan 59 humbucker in it that I play in one song that I just have a lot of fun with. I mean, I can, I can, you know, rock out and beat the heck out of, out of a Strat for one song, you know, it's just fun, <laughs> which I played, you know, in, in Nugent or whatever, you know, in that, in the eighties. So I kind of keep that, because that's close to my heart too, you know. I have I have a lot of strats too, you know, from collecting wise too. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I have a '54 strat first year. Oh wow! I like to get the first year of stuff. I don't know what that means, but like the first year off the line, a '54 strat, you know. Well, that's, um, that makes sense, man. People are like, if you collect comic books, you like Daredevil or Spider Man, you want to get Daredevil number one or Spider Man. Number one, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I told totally you. Or 52, 52 Gold Top Les Paul, I got that too. You know, just oh, you do? Year. Wow. Yeah. It's got a trapeze tail piece. You can't really play it because it's, it's the wrong way, you know, it's the wrong, but it's, you know, it's a first year. And then I have a couple of uh, uh, Les Paul Juniors, which are 54s as well, first year. So I just like to say, yeah, I got the first year of. You know when when it was started, really. How do those juniors sound? Amazing, yeah, I amazing. Love those I like guitars, man. Six of them. It's amazing. Wow, they're they're amazing. I can't play it with our. I mean, I could, I guess, but I I, I lean towards humbuckers versus the P nineties. Oh, the P, P90 in P90 and all of them. Yeah, P, okay. the early ones are P nineties. Yeah, but they're. I mean, they're strong, and the fifties ones are amazing. Amazing. I like to collect them versus playing them. You know. Um, I think Johnny A, my you know buddy Johnny, yeah. I think he did an interview with yeah. the, he likes yeah. the P nineties, the junior P nineties. You know, yeah. I think he just came out with a a signature one. He had a couple made just now. Yeah, I think he's got an Epiphone one. Oh, it's an Epiphone. I, th- I, oh, think, yeah, so. Yeah. I think so. I think so. Yeah. yeah, I think so because his Gibson yeah. one. He's got a couple of juniors too. Gibson juniors, I think. They Does just he? Made. Oh, okay. Yeah. I didn't know that. Okay, cool. I think they're trying to call it the Yardbirds ones because that's what he plays in the Yardbirds. Yes. Okay, maybe. Yeah. yeah, he did mention something about that. Yeah, so he, he likes the junior with the P90s. You know, I, I like the, the humbuckers, so I stick with the standards and, and my, you know, my guitar has got a humbucker. Yeah, I prefer so, humbuckers as well over P90s. Yeah, I, I, I prefer them, but I love the... If you if I collect the old ones, I got a bunch of fifties. They got P nineties that just killer, just killer. I, I just I use it in the studio or or I just play it at home. You know whatever. So cool, man. You, yeah, you got like a museum there, man. Oh, um, but you know I'm, I I have fun with mine. You know there's there's guys. With, I mean Bonamassa is just <laughs> ridiculous. I oh my god, yeah. That's ridiculous. It's you know and, and Sam Bora has got a big uh, collection. Pretty, oh my god, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's got amazing stuff. You know, flying V fifty late fifties flying V uh, Explorer. He's got like, those are four. great because those flying V's, the old ones are totally different than the new ones. Yeah, if you can find them, I mean, they're ridiculous yeah. money. Yeah. You know, I, I don't have anything like that, but I got some. I got I got my share. You yeah, know? you got some great ones. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Um, is there anybody who influences your playing, Dave? That people might be surprised to hear. You know, you know who first did, and which is probably not in my wheelhouse right now. But but uh, Richie Blackmore was huge with me when I was younger. Richie Blackmore, you know, I I guess that's the Strat thing, you know, mm-hmm. which I guess you know with Ario, I'm I'm a Les Paul guy now, you know. So I mean, I was always a Les Paul guy too. But when I saw Richie Blackmore when I was younger. Mm-hmm play a strat through a marshal and he throw it up in the air and bust it on the stage. I just thought, I want to do that, man. <laughs> Richie Blackmore was just my idol, which I don't think, like you said, I don't think anybody would know yeah, that, that was... from now from my playing now, you know? You know, it's but, funny. Literally yesterday, I read an article. He's in like this month, some one of the guitar magazines, and he was saying that um, in the beginning – the very beginning when he switched over to Marshalls because he always used to play Voxes, he wanted to play Marshalls, but they couldn't make a Marshall that sounded. So they took the innards of a Vox out, put it in a Marshall cabinet. And in the beginning, he was playing Voxes in a Marshall cabinet. I'll be damn, really? Yeah, I, I was wow. like, yeah, that was really I interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, and he goes, he goes, shortly afterwards, they, they were able to, 
you know, he goes, I didn't want, I wanted a Vox sound. I just wanted a, a, I wanted a Marshall look. And a Marshall, yeah. Yeah, it was really funny. And he said, you know, shortly afterwards, obviously they developed their own, you know. Well, he had, ch- yeah. he had the super, uh, uh, the 200 watt uh, major. Yes. Major. Yes. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. Right, right. 200 Crazy. watts. It's all in the articles. And I think this month's Guitar Magazine, maybe. It yeah. Was. So I, I don't think that would, anybody yeah, I would have heard that about me. That, that was, uh, that was, uh, that was a good question because I don't think I've ever been asked that question. Uh, Richie Blackmore, big influence when I was younger. Great big. guitar player, man. Yeah, Great I mean, guitar player. of course, Jimi Hendrix and yeah, and the Clifton usual, and, and and I think Jeff Beck is God. Oh, I right agree now. with you. Yeah, Jeff Beck, you know, I agree with is you. Is that bad to say? You know, I think Jeff Beck is you know, no, Clapton, no. Clapton used to be God. I don't think Clapton anymore is God. Jeff Beck is God. No, I, he he's the most. I I interviewed two of his guitar players. I interviewed Jennifer Batten and and Carmen yeah. Vandenberg, and I was like, man, how does he do that? And they were like, fuck if I <laughs> I studied it for three. Jennifer is brilliant guitar player. Oh, Je- I love Jennifer. Yeah. I've seen Jennifer with Beck. As a matter of fact, she's it, amazing. Yeah, and and even yeah. she was like, you know, <laughs> it's it's Jeff Beck, and but they both. One thing they said was, he is never not without a guitar in his hands. Really. Wow. Well, so he, even him, he has to work at being Jeff Beck is the bottom line. You know, I mean, it's, it's, you know, you don't just fog a mirror and say, oh, I can play like Jeff Beck. This is an right. ongoing, you know, never ending thing. And they said he's playing all the time. He, he's, he, he is, he's just like, you know, there's the top of the ladder and then he's just, yeah. uh, th- there's no, there's no rungs to get there. Yeah. You know, no, I agree. There's no rung. he's, 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 he's up there somewhere and, and, how old is he now? Seven? I don't know. 70. 70. 70. And when you consider he's doing all that without a pick, it's nuts. It's, it, it gives it gives me goosebumps. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to, to, to think about him, you know, when I see the videos and, and I, I saw him. I, I, Sam Borer called. This was years ago. Sam Borer says, hey, I got an extra ticket to uh, we going to Jeff Beck. Whatever, wow. You know, down in, in L.A. You want to come? I'm like, well, do I? Sure, yeah. let's go. So I went with Richie and we sat next to each other and just watched him. This is years ago. And just watched him go, and he had the strat into a Wawa, into the front of a Marshall. That's it. Yeah. I, we, we tracked it, you know, Tr- front of a Marshall, one cab, 412 cabinet. I don't know, it was a DSL head, 150 uh, maybe, I think it was 50. And he just did some things. And Richie, when I was like, what did he, what did he just do there? I said, I, I don't know what he just did there. Yeah. I, can't, I can't believe what he just did. And, Rich, and Sam Borg goes, I, I, we should quit. We should give up. <laughs> so, you know, we should give up because I, I believe, it, it, yeah. we can never. Go, how do you going to achieve that? It's, it's insane what he uh, was doing. Really, alive. Cool. You know, other than even on videos, it's, 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 it's amazing. He's he's on another planet. Yeah, I agree with you. Another guy that was like that that I thought um, was Roy Buchanan, <laughs> to be honest with you. But you know, oh, he's yeah. been gone a long time. But yeah, sure, he was very similar to that. I don't think he sure. was. I think Beck's taken it to another level. But Buchanan was like certainly. Yeah, right yeah. along that plane, man. You yeah. Know? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. I agree with you. Um, you know, when I was a kid, you know, Leslie West was, you know, there's, there's a there's an SG player, you know, with yeah. with a what a tone tone. You know, yeah. when I was a kid, I was like, wow, Leslie West. You know, I mean, I have a, a lot of influences, but I think I think Richie Blackmore was at the time mm. was just like, I want to do that, you know. Uh, you know, he'd throw his, he'd throw his strat up in the air and try to catch it over to hit the floor and bust off a piece of strat, you know, and then he'd go to his roadie and he'd pick up another one and try to catch it. again. I thought, well, that's like insane. Yeah. You know, it, I just, I used to go see Deep Purple all the time and go, it, that's amazing. He's amazing. You know, of course the marshals, he'd been, you know, button his, his, his strat up and get through the marshal cabinets and busting the grill cloth off. I'm like, wow, that's, I, I want to do that. You he's know? touring now. Uh, yeah, I heard. He's I touring heard. with. He's playing Rainbow songs. Oh, is he okay? Not, yeah, and, and, and he, yeah, he's he's doing old Rainbow stuff and just like not not like a full blown tour, but just here and there. I think he's you know six or oh, seven okay, dates okay. or something like. I'd that. I like so, to I'd like to see him again. That'd be, that'd be interesting. I'd be. I'd, I'd see him in a heartbeat, man. Yeah, yeah. Um, musically, if I asked you to pick your top three Desert Island discs in no particular order. And knowing that you can change tomorrow, what would like? What's your knee jerk reaction? Will be the first three albums that come to mind right <laughs> this minute. Oh man! Oh boy! Well, it'd have to be a Beatles record for sure. Yeah, for me. That. Yeah. Um, 
God, it, you know, it, it, it's so close with all these, be, you know, Beetle, uh, uh, Revolver or something like, you know, Revolver or, or um, Rubber Soul. You know, I mean, I could, I could say all, I could, I could say all of them. You know, mm -hmm. um, Jimi Hendrix, are you experienced? Great oh, come album. on, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. um, maybe. God, I'm, I'm, no, I'm, I'm thinking back, right? You know what I mean? I'm going sure back to what influenced me. Uh, probably, you know, Machine Head, maybe from Deep Purple. Deep Purple, maybe. great album. Machine Head, probably. You know, I don't know. You know, what a what a record! I'm, I'm sure just the top three. I mean, I probably got a dozen of them. You know what I mean? Just, I'm probably, you know, I'm, probably, I'm just off the top of my head yeah, here. I don't know. That's cool. You know? Good music, man. Um, you know, as a guitar player, I guess, leaning towards, you know. Yeah. I mean, Hendrix, you know, yikes. Yeah, that Are You Experience album was pretty phenomenal. Wow. Yeah. You know, you know, when I was a kid, gee whiz, I, I didn't even, could, couldn't even fathom what he was doing. You know what I mean? Just the, even the album cover itself. Do you remember that double album, <laughs> Gatefold, it folded out? That was so cool. With all those, sure. you know, like half, well, they were all naked, all the girls that were naked on there. It was just like yeah. nothing, you didn't see anything like that. Right, right, yeah. and and uh, Rubber Soul. It came out like a Christmas time when I was a kid. I looked at that record for about a month every day, just to look at that <laughs> hair in the front, and you know, just read the liner notes about eighteen thousand times. Yeah. You know, just a Rubber Soul was just oh my god, you know, just I don't know. And it, but all the records, all yeah. the Beatles records are like that for me. But I just remember Rubber Soul, and then Revolver. It was kind of like a, even George Harrison said. Revolver and Rubber Soul were kind of like a it's a double disc. Mm. You know, they just went from you know, Rubber Soul to Revolver. It was kind of like the same. You know, they had all these songs. Yeah, it wasn't it, a dramatic it, change of, you know, it wasn't like Sgt. Pepper's or something like that. Right. Yeah, no, it was, it was the same continuum. Like this, he, George Harrison said I read an article, he said it could have been the same record. Could have been a double record. Yeah. Double album. So, amazing songs, every song. So, I I guess I'm probably I'm probably missing people are gonna go like well there's, there's, there's plenty of other no well it's just them, knee jerk you know? reaction right now man that's all yeah hey, that's it tough question <laughs> what do you like most about yourself wow that's a tough one um ah, shit I I don't know I I think I'm I, I think I'm a, a good person I, you know I I get hired because I you know I I I can get along with with people and and I just love in you know dealing with music I, I love music so much and guitars and it's just it's easy for me to fall into that you know with with other musicians or or maybe a situation like I guess that's why I got a lot of sessions because you know I enjoy playing so much and um, you know I like I like the challenge of it I like challenges like you know I'm, I'm doing this Vegas thing in Rock Vault and it challenges me that I love it so much that I'm going next this coming week. I'm going back to Rock Vault because I love it so much, and and the guys are so great. And I, 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 I like, I like you know interacting with other musicians. You know, I, I I like that, and I don't know about myself. I don't know. I guess you didn't answer the question yet. You know that. Right? I know. I know. <laughs> That's a tough question. I like about myself. Oh my god, I never even asked that. I don't know. Uh, well, the next question is not getting any easier. Oh shit! <laughs> um, I I think I like about myself. Wow. I, I think I, I I enjoy. I don't know if this this is. I don't know if this is answers the question even. I I enjoy life, man. I enjoy. I I, I enjoy my life. You know about. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, I think I, that's a. I think that answers it. I, I enjoy life every every day. You know, I'm living in California. This sunshine out my window and and i'm playing guitar for a living and that's i have a lot of guitars and i'm, I'm doing what i want to do you know i'm i i enjoy me for you know what i've done i guess yeah. you know what mm -hmm. have I, i've gotten this far and and i still want to go farther you know sure. um i don't even know if that answers anything no it's <laughs> cl it close I, I, close enough i'll give you a pass i can join my, <laughs> my i joined this life i've got i really enjoy 
what what I've uh, accomplished, I guess. You know, you're a very optimistic guy in general. Your outlook on things is really optimistic, and I would oh, bet. Yes. Well, yeah, I mean, and that as somebody dealing with you, that's a real. It's great to be around people like that that are you know that are optimistic that are looking at the glass half full that aren't you know f- fucking you know miserable and just you know no, that, that's I mean, a that's a real a- appeal man to, no, to, to okay oh, well thanks yeah, yeah. you just like you just there you go i answered it i answered I my, so, right? what i like most about you um i don't want to say that about myself i just i just enjoy what i do and i enjoy every day in life and i'm, I'm a lucky i consider myself a, the you know an elite it's the elite to play music and make money, and I can buy these craziness, the amplifiers behind me, and it makes me happy. You know, it's great. What's not to be happy about? I hear you, man. And and that's not to say what's really cool about that is you have the same bullshit everybody else has to deal with in life, but you're not focusing on that. You're focusing no. on the good things, which is awesome. Oh, I, I see what you're yeah. saying. Yeah, okay. Yeah, All right. yeah. That's 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 what's cool. I think you answered it for me. <laughs> to say it about so myself, it's a, I never... a group project it takes a it takes a what is it, it takes a village it takes an army it takes a know, village it takes, a, it takes uh, a village there you go it takes a village. How about this one? If you could change one thing about yourself, what would that be? <laughs> You're killing me. <laughs> uh, D- Dave is actually turning red. This is quite interesting. I, I yeah, think I am. You, yeah, you are. Oh man! I... Wow! Wow! I've never been asked. These are good questions. I've never been asked these questions. I swear to God. Good. Um, oh, man. I changed one thing. Uh, I, I guess I, I kind of changed it already. You know, I, I, like I said, I'm a little more open to a little more open things. Not so, you know, not so hard headed about, you know, I mean, not, not about life or anything, just about maybe situations. Sure. You know, uh, mostly, well, maybe personal too. You know, about personal. I, I get kind of thick-headed sometimes about mm. about things. You know, my own way. But I, I kind of loosened up on that, so I've kind of dealt with that. You know, in my life, and and uh, you know, I'm maybe not all the, maybe not a hundred percent, but I'm trying to change. You know, I'm trying to get better or whatever. But yeah, man. but I'm pretty positive on on things. I think you know, so. Uh, I'm not saying I got flaws. I don't have any flaws, I should say, but I do. I think you'd be actually you'd actually be good to run for office because you just didn't answer both of those questions in a very <laughs> in a very positive way. Like I got nothing to say. <laughs> I don't I, because I'm talking. You used to ask me to talk about myself, and yeah. I'm like, hmm. Uh, well, let I me. Don't know. How about this one? Tell me something about yourself. People would either be surprised to hear or might find a little odd. <laughs> You're killing me with these questions. <laughs> oh man! Uh, no, I, I don't know. Stupid. I, I like cats. I got I got two cats in the house here. That that'd be like. What does he like cats? Really? He doesn't like a dog. Whatever. Um, I, I like I like animals. I love all animals. Yeah, that's. Cool. I, I mean, I don't know. It's uh, God. That's probably a stupid answer. No, it's a good answer. No, th- man, there's no right or wrong answer here. There's only the yeah. truth. That's the whole thing about this show. There's only the truth. No, I, I mean, I'm an no an, right I'm an animal right. guy. I, I love animals. You mm-hmm. know, I, I have two cats in here. I can't have any more animals. I probably would have more, but I, you know, I go on the road all the time and I live by myself here. So yeah, um, you know, I have two of them that are friends of mine in here. That's kind of fun. There's one right there. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I like I like hot cars too, but I mean, you might know that already. You know, mm-hmm. I like Cor- I like Corvettes. I'm a Corvette guy. What's there not to like about that, man? I know exactly. I know. I I'm, like assu- Cor- I'm assuming I like you're Cor- talking about like old Stingrays. Oh, old yeah, Stingrays! Yeah, I love it. Yeah, yeah. I, I have you know relatively new one, a 15 uh, Corvette Z06. You know, which I like. I like the fast one, 650 horse. I like that. That's- doesn't it even rock. 650 horse 650 horse yeah. it's like having a 200 watt marshall in your engine you well know? i love that too exactly <laughs> cars and cars use like cars and guitars which which they probably you know i'm not well rounded i kind of like i told you i like what i like you no, know that's, i kind of just stick with that it's not uh i don't i don't invent the wheel i like i really like what i like and it's kind of narrow a narrow field you know but I'm happy with what I got, you know? 
Yeah, that's all that counts, man. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask you just uh, three more questions here. Who's had the biggest influence on your life? Person who's had the biggest influence on your life? Uh, Oh, wow. I I, I think my parents, for sure. My parents, you know, my... uh, we used to rehearse in my basement, you know, back in Boston. Hmm. And, uh, it, it, yeah, it was just, you know, we always had my band downstairs, you know. The, the whole basement was was for me to do what, you know, what I wanted down there. It was it was just let me let me be me, you hmm. know. And so I had a good upgrade. I had great parents. No brothers, no sisters, just, just a mother, you know, my mother and father. And uh, Are they still around? No, oh, no. Sorry about that. Day. Yeah. Oh, thanks. No, a long time ago. Hmm. Um, yeah, my, my mother was a, a really good influence, you know, because, cause of course, in the 60s, you know, when you started growing your hair, you know, my, my dad would think, like, oh, you're smoking pot, you know, like, you know, and my mother would say, no, he's not. He's downstairs. He's practicing his guitar, you know. And I was like, my dad thinks when I grow, you know, at, at that time, when you grew your, when you grew your hair, you were smoking pot. Or whatever. That's a, that's and you're a, a communist. Yeah, go ahead and <laughs> that's true. <laughs> you know, but my mother would go, "Leave him alone." You know, he's downstairs. You know, you know where he is. He's listen to him. You know, he's, he's playing through a marshal downstairs. You know, <laughs> and he's knocking the glass off the off the shelves. <laughs> you know, because a hundred watt marshal. You know, and goes going deaf then. So she was um, she was a big influence. You know, a big catalyst on on giving me the green light, you know, mm-hmm. my, my dad might've been a little bit more stubborn because of the drug thing, you know, sixties drug thing, whatever. Sure. but I wasn't like that. I never was. So, but my mother would go, leave him alone. He, you know, he's right there. He's, he's, he's playing his stuff, you know? Mm. So it was good. And, but, but he was good too. Cause he let us, you know, the bands downstairs, you know, yeah, he, all my bands, you know, all right, you can rehearse in the, in the cellar. You know, That's <laughs> great. Yeah. It's awesome. Do they have, awesome. do they have basements in California? No. Well, very seldom. They have like, no, not really. Mine's a slab here. My house is a slab. Not really. No. I didn't think so. Because earthquakes. Yeah, well, they don't have them in Florida because we're so close to sea level. So I was just curious. We we have earthquakes. So it's pretty much a lot of slabs, you know? Mm, Sure. Um, uh, A a couple of them have like crawl spaces, you know, so you can put the pipes or whatever. But they don't, I don't really know anybody that has a a basement around here. You know, it's all it's all different. But back in back in Boston, you know, everybody had basements. Yeah, everybody. of course. Yeah. yeah. Same, same in New York. Yeah. So, most important lesson your business has taught you. Mm. Huh. Um, well, to keep um, keep believing in in what you're doing. You know, keep keep just. Um, you mean the the record business or music just, business? Music business. I, I think just be, just keep believing in what you're doing. If you believe in yourself, uh, you know, I think you'll it'll be honest and you'll you'll make something of it. You know, it, uh, the business is really, especially now, the business is really hard. Yeah. You know. So, but and but I'm still you know we're still chugging along and we're still doing what we're doing and we're making a living at it and. You know, just believe in yourself. Don't give up. You know, because it's it's the, the record business is extremely tough, especially at this point. You know, people are making their own records in their house houses, and 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 it's so tough to. You know, there's no more record deals. I guess you can get a record deal, but it's, you know, it's it's crazy. So, I think just, you know, to believe in yourself. I think taught me most. Just believe in yourself and and keep going. You know and I've never changed. I'm still doing, you know, what I did all along. Hmm. You know, not not much has changed really in the in the design of what I, you know. Yeah, yeah. In, in the frame I, framework of what you do. Frame, it, yeah. yeah, framework. Oh, here comes here comes. A, there goes your cat, man. <laughs> here comes another the other one. There you another go. One. He's he's coming across my path here. There we go. Yeah. Um, yeah, and okay. then the last question, which you've kind of answered, but we revisit it. <laughs> What's been the biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years and how much of this has been deliberate and how much is just a part of aging? Again, you've answered some of this. If there's anything else <laughs> you can talk about, if not. Wow. These, these are questions I've never been asked before. That's which is, good. Which is, is kind of, um, 
well, just looking at myself here like it was like a therapy session. That's uh, what, do you know who Doug Bossy is? No, I know the name, but I don't know. He's a he's out in California. Great guitar player. He said he said a fantastic guitar player, really good guy. He said uh, he goes. I think your show should be called "Everyone Loves Guitar" and then in brackets and therapy. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Let me let me say that too. I hope this is on record because so I'm looking at myself here, going, "Oh my god, I got problems." No, oh my god, <laughs> hell no. God. I got problems. Yeah, I better fix. No something. more than any of us, any of the rest of oh us. That's god. for sure. Oh uh, wait a minute. What what was the forgot the question? The question was, what's been the biggest change in your personality over the last ten years, and how much of this has been deliberate and intentional on your part, and how much has just been a part of aging? <sighs> oh my God, this is ther- this is a therapy session. I think I owe you some money. How much am I going to charge for this? <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Um, uh, well, yeah, a custom I I a Dave that. Amato custom signature. <laughs> <laughs> It's expensive therapy. <laughs> expensive therapy. I go, yeah. How much for this session, for sure? Um, well, I think it comes, like I said, I, I think, like you said, I answered this before. I think it comes with age. You know, you get more mellow and you get hopefully smarter, yeah. which, you know, I don't know how smart I'm getting. But um, in, in dealing, you know, with your fellow bandmates or dealing with people, you just maybe more more patient or more considerate or something, you know, um, I guess you learn as you go. Um, like I said, you know, with, with the band, you know, uh, pertaining to the band, you know, I don't fight so much with, with songs, you know, what, what songs Kevin wants to play live or whatever, you know, Hmm. I mean, we, we even jostled with it last year. We had two songs that he wanted to, to, to say that I didn't feel like it was in this, I feel like it slowed the set down in the middle. But he wanted to say something, you know, and mm. these songs that he picked said something which is meaningful to him, you sure. know, to his person, you know, his person. He wanted to get that out to the public, which I thought it slowed the set down, which I think it did, you know. But he wanted to say something because he had to get it out and say something to him. So I let it go versus, you know, 10 years ago. I would have bucked him on it and said, well, "Why are we doing that? You know, that doesn't. The set yeah. is going downhill, and and not not paying attention to his his feelings. Yeah, you know, yeah. What I mean, I think I think I'm more uh, considerate of feeling. I, I still got to. I think believe in my <laughs> therapy session because I think I need some more work on that. But I think I'm trying to be more considerate." you know, in my feelings and instead of being there you go for the stubborn stubbornness about me, you know, yeah. I'm like just going, you know, the set's dying. We got to take those songs out no matter what you think, you yeah. know, about it. I don't, I'm not considering his feelings about what he wants to say in those particular songs. Yeah. So I think that's a big change in me. It's kind of, kind of taking a breath, you know I mean? Yeah, not, yeah. not jumping like 10 or 20 years ago. I just jump. I mean, I just, I'd probably bite your head off, you know, like that's no. so interesting. Yeah, I'm I'm seeing the the flip end of that, man. It's really hard yeah. to, to imagine that. Well, I think you're seeing me now. Yeah, we just you know, we just met, you know, yeah. a, a little little bit ago. So S- six but, months ago, <laughs> it yeah. seems like. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't. I, I that was saying wrong. I'd bite your head off, but I'd I'd be quick to ju- quick to make a decision. You know, yeah, like, yeah. No, we shouldn't do that. You know, why are we why are we doing that? Yeah, Come on, yeah. man. You know. Come on, and, and not really thinking about maybe the other guy's feelings, what he he wants. You know, mm-hmm. maybe uh, I'm, <laughs> and I've maybe been told this in some of my relationships too. You know, <laughs> like, where, you know, hey Dave, you're not thinking about me. You know, so I, I think that's changed in my life. You know, or I'm still I'm still working on that. Um, oh, master. <laughs> don't, oh, don't, don't say that because that implies i have my shit together and that is the f- furthest thing from the truth well we're always we're always learning right That's yeah nice. all the work we're in progress man day. yeah every hell day. yeah hey listen man uh let me just tell people where they could find you i really appreciate your time you've been awesome to deal with in every, uh-huh. hey, every way possible hey, man. craig i can see you're a good friend man and likewise and, uh, we, we, we've talked about some good things even off the air that, yeah you know, yeah we can't put on the air that no. really uh <laughs> Uh, you know, family <laughs> oriented, you know, and, and uh, friends, good yeah, friends man. now. Yeah. I would. Right. And I said, I said, call me, 
you know, call me anytime you want to speak off the air, off the record, and, and we'll talk, you know, so. 100%. It's, uh, it's closeness with good friends. It's just great. 100%, uh, great, man. You know, knowing you, man. Likewise. Hey, uh, let me tell people where to find you. First of all, um, Dave's getting ready to go out and do about 70 or 80 shows with REO Speedwagon. So please check out REO Speedwagon and go out and, and support Dave and the REO guys. Uh, they've been at this a really long time. Dave's been alone. has been with the band 28 years. And uh, they're still selling out arenas and shows and whatever venues they're playing. Um if you want to, if you're a lead guitar player and you want to check out a fantastic guitar, check out Dave's. It's Dave Amato, A M A T O, his custom signature Gibson Les Paul, uh, single humbucker '57 classic, Floyd Rose, abs, a white ebony uh, fretboard, gorgeous freaking guitar, seven pounds. Um, he's also got an ovation, an acoustic ovation Viper. Right, that's right. Yeah, in in the in their arsenal over there. Yeah, ovation made me a. Uh, uh, Ovation Viper, yeah, and, and uh, I think it's a, a beauty. I, they, um, I was a little skeptical at first, and, and they said, we want to make you something cool, and, and I, I kind of put my two cents in for the design, and and they, they sent it to me from the, they opened up the new factory, well, the old factory in, in uh, Connecticut, again, the old Ovation factory. They oh, got I know, they're back making and they those got, here. <clears throat> yeah, That's and great. the custom shop, it's a custom shop in uh, Connecticut. And uh, they built me one there, six string Viper, and uh, they sent it to me, and I was really impressed. I, I couldn't believe it. I said, you know, look, even if you make one and I didn't like it, I said I'd pay for it, whatever, you know. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. cause I, I wasn't sure if I wanted to jump on board, but it was so good, I, I couldn't resist. So they make me um, the six string Viper, and then uh, they made me a double neck as well. So I have a, a double neck version, a twelve string, six string, and a six string Viper, which uh, they did a great job on it. Awesome. They're uh, really nice people too. And so, um, so I have that acoustically, and I have my Gibson Les Paul Access uh, at Gibson. So I'm I'm a lucky guy. <laughs> awesome. So please yeah. check out Dave's guitars, the Ovation Viper, and the custom signature Dave and model Les Paul Access. And um, that's a bit. That's about it, man. We'll have uh, part two of Dave and Craig go to therapy. Uh, so <laughs> 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 but it could be a new show. It could be a new, it's yeah. new show. <laughs> Everybody loves therapy. Everybody loves therapy. Yes, yeah, so that's a we're going to have Dave Amato head, head headlining that podcast. I'm I'm a, <laughs> yeah, okay. I got my hands full. Oh You're in um, trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Listen man, I can't thank you enough for your time. You're awesome. Really oh, got, like, got to to uh, to meet you and connect with you. Um, everybody, check out Dave on the road and check out Ario Speedwagon and support the guys that have been doing what they're doing for a long time. They're great at it. Everyone, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview and had as much fun as I did. Thanks again to Dave Amato for spending all this time with us. I really appreciate it. Go to everyonelovesguitar.com. Sign up to get notified about future episodes. Add your name to the mailing list. You'll get some early product announcements and discounts. And most importantly, remember that happiness is a choice. So be nice, choose wisely, go play a guitar and have some fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music. 